We've been having a wonderful time, night after night, uh, here in this auditorium. In fact, every night except the night of the prize fight. We were not here that night. We were having some rain showers in Clewiston. And uh, we have seen this great building. The crowds grow night after night. Tonight the building is filled, as Cliff has already said. And already we can sense a moving of the Spirit of God in Miami. As we move about the city, people are talking about it. And I must say a word of appreciation to the newspapers of this city for the tremendous coverage that they have given in making it possible for people to be aware of what is happening here. I believe, as one man expressed it to me today, it's having a healthy effect on the city. And we are very grateful that God has seen fit to bless this great crusade here on Miami Beach. Now tonight, I want to speak on the subject of the American home. And I want you to turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, the 19th chapter. The 19th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. How many have your Bibles? Lift them up. Look at the Bibles. I've been amazed since I've been in Miami at the number of Bibles that are here night after night. Open your Bibles to the 19th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And I notice that so many Bibles are new Bibles. And we've been encouraging people to buy Bibles. And I suggested that you buy a Bible with big print so that uh, you can read it. And uh, then I'd like to see you supplement your normal Bible with a modern translation. Because a modern translation helps you to understand it in the language of our day. You see, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew and Greek. And it was translated into King James 300 years ago. But we no longer speak that language. And many of the sentences and statements and paragraphs and verses are very difficult to make out, not because God meant them to be hard to understand, but because they are written in a language we no longer speak. Now, I read from the King James. I have my devotions from the King James. And I love the King James. But I also have several other translations, modern translations, that I use to supplement my Bible reading, and it's helped me to understand the Bible so much more. Now the 19th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorce, and to put her away? And Jesus answered unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which, put a, which is put away doth commit adultery. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. I'm simply reading from the Bible. Now I think that all of us are aware that something is wrong with the American home. I receive hundreds of letters every day on marital problems. I write a little column called My Answer in a number of newspapers across the country. And about 60% of the letters I get have to do with marital problems or problems of courtship 
or sex or some of those problems that surround the marriage relationship. And I found across the country there's a vast ignorance and there's also a tremendous amount of unhappiness and unrest when it comes to our marriage relationship. The sociologists tell us that the home is the basic unit of every society. And when the home begins to crumble and break, that society is on the way down. That society is in danger. The first institution ever established before the church, before the school, before the government, was the home. And I believe that a nation is only as strong as her home. And yet, one million Americans were divorced last year. Young people come to me in June with stars in their eyes. They want to get married. They get married, and by December, many of them are unhappy and say that our home is on the rocks and our home is already a hell on earth. What's wrong? Where did they miss it? Did they take the wrong turn somewhere? What happened? That a home that started out with such promise and such love and excitement and ecstasy could in a few months be in serious danger of crumbling. We've heard the voice of the sociologist and the psychiatrist. Many people are studying this. We have over 2,000 professors in the United States today that are teaching courses on marriage in the home in our colleges and universities and by and large most of them are doing a wonderful job from a humanistic point of view. But there's a deeper level that I fear that our magazine articles that deal with this subject and our university and college courses on marriage in the family are not touching. You see, God performed the first marriage. It is a divine institution. And God had certain rules and regulations concerning marriage, and he said if you keep them, you'll have success and fulfillment in marriage, but if you break them, you'll have disappointment in marriage. Tonight, I want us to turn to the Bible. I want us to see what the Bible has to say about this all-important subject of marriage. The Bible teaches that marriage is a miracle. It is God that joins together, and they become one flesh. Now, the greatest stumbling block to marriage, do you know what it is? Selfishness. And it all begins in courtship. We say, well, we're in love when we're not in love at all. It's infatuation. And infatuation leads us astray and fools us. And it's not real love. And so when you find one selfish person joining hands with another selfish person and they pool their selfishness, that marriage is on the rocks from the beginning. Many people get married because of their passionate attraction to each other physically. Unless marriage is on a much deeper level and a broader dimension, that marriage is also in trouble. The Bible teaches marriage is a divine institution. In Genesis, the second chapter, God said, it is not good that the man should be alone I will make him a helpmeet for him. Now that word helpmeet means a compliment. A man is not altogether a whole man without that rib that God took from him to create the woman. God put man to sleep, you remember, and took a rib out of man and made a woman so that man would not be lonely. So the reason you ladies are here at all is because man was lonely. And man could not be completely happy without you. That's your glory. But it's also sort of humbling to realize that uh, you come from a man's rib. And you need the man. Because you're not a whole woman. 
God made it that way. He planned it that way, not only to keep the human race going biologically, but in order to find complete fulfillment, marriage is far more than a sex relationship. Marriage is a spiritual union for a destiny and a purpose. God has a purpose to bring two people together to do His work. It's the total commitment of our lives together for a reason. It's a divine institution. God meant it that way. He planned it that way. He ordained it that way. He performed the first marriage and he puts his seal on that. Now some people get married because of a feeling of inferiority, a fear of loneliness, a fear of financial insecurity, a desire to escape school, some of them. Or maybe out of spite or social prestige, whatever it is, many of these reasons why we get married in the beginning cause us to have trouble later on. And we don't stop to realize that this is the second most important step in life and most of these choices are made in your late teens or early twenties when you're still in your adolescent period, emotionally immature. And young people make many mistakes because they take infatuation for love. But there's still a deeper point in which you can be sure he's the right man and he's, she's the right girl. Get God's choice. God has a man for you. God has a woman for you. Somewhere, just for you, made for you. And if you come to Christ, Receive him as your savior. Ask God to lead you. He will lead you to precisely the right one. And there'll be no mistake and it won't end in a divorce. Because you see, the center of your marriage will not be in yourself. The center of your marriage will be in Christ. Your selfishness will be gone and it'll all be given to him. You young girls, that are whistling at the boys, you wait on God's choice. You young fellows, pray that God will lead you to the right girl. His choice. Let him plan your life because you see it's for a lifetime. It's not for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. It's a lifetime. You're going to have to see him when he's old and gray. You're going to have to be with him in sickness and in health. Through tragedy. And his tragedies and his successes will be yours. It's a lifetime together fulfilling the destiny that God meant for you to have. It's to be entered into seriously and prayerfully, letting God make the choice. But you see, you can't have that security in marriage unless you know Christ. I don't know how people make it without Christ at all, really, in the marriage relationship. I don't know how they trust each other. In Christ, there's a dimension to love and a capacity for love that you cannot find outside of Christ. I believe even in the love act, there is a fulfillment and a capacity that is far deeper when you know Christ and you're committed to Christ, then outside of Christ. There are three Greek words used for love. Eros, phileo, agapao. Eros is sensual love. Many people's love between husband and wife, uh, fiancé and fiancé, are based on eros. Just physical attraction. No deeper, no more. That marriage doesn't have a chance. The second one is phileo. That's human love. That's the average marriage relationship. But there's another one that's called agapao, and that is a depth and a breadth and a height that only God can give. You see, before you come to Christ, you don't have the possibility of loving your neighbor as you ought to, or even your wife as you should. I was just talking to a friend a moment ago, Jimmy Carroll. 
from Little Rock, Arkansas. Jimmy Caram helped lead that mob in Little Rock two or three, year, three years ago. For 30 years, he never went inside a church. Nobody ever asked him to go to church. But Jimmy Caram received Jesus Christ as his Savior. His life was transformed by Christ, and Christ gave him a capacity. And he was telling Dr. Paul Musselman and I just a moment ago before we came in here. He said, you know, I could not love my fellow man until Christ came into my heart. He enlarged my capacities. The same is true in marriage. Give your life to Christ, then you begin to really love. And some of you older people, your love has gone dead. You're still living together, but it's really a living lie. It's just the shell of a marriage that once was. The love has gone dead. You're really at the end of your rope. Give your life to Christ and he will light anew that love and you will love her or him a hundred times more than you ever did even on your honeymoon. Try it and see. Because Christ enlarges your capacity to love. He gives you divine love. And you express that love to your wife, to your husband. Now, that doesn't mean there's not tension sometimes in the home and difficulties and little irritations and all. But you see, the whole atmosphere is different. And you approach marriage from God's point of view, and he helps you to live toward each other with the courtesy and the thoughtfulness and the gentleness and the patience that he gives. I've seen hundreds of marriages changed and transformed by Christ. Husband, for your sake, for your wife's sake, for your children's sake, give your life to Christ tonight. Wives, give your life to Christ and be the Christian wife and mother that you ought to be. He can help you. Then not only is marriage a divine institution, but secondly, marriage is a divine safeguard. The Bible reveals how God safeguards the marriage relationship by imposing the severest possible penalties upon adultery and fornication. In all the Bible, there is hardly a worse sin than the sin of unfaithfulness. And today, it's rampant in America. A sin that caused the downfall of civilizations of the past, a sin that is condemned from one end of the Bible to the other as an offense against God, as an offense against yourself, as an offense against your partner, an offense against yourself, uh, uh, against your community and your family. I tell you, this is America's great sin. And God is going to judge us, and the Bible says that all adulterers will be in the lake that burneth with fire. I didn't say that. God said it. Marriage is a divine institution, and God has put a safeguard around it. And in the Old Testament, he demanded the death penalty for committing this sin. But today we take it for granted. Every community is filled with it. We think there's nothing wrong with it. I tell you, there is something wrong with it, and you're going to stand at the judgment of God and give an account. A lady wrote me the other day, and I think I answered it in one of the columns. She said that her husband was so flirty with young girls, and she said that her husband was 71 years of age. And there's nothing any worse to me than an old goat trying to be young. <laughs> and then thirdly, not only is there a divine safeguard, but there's a divine plan. God has a plan concerning marriage. Now he says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion with light with darkness. Now, the Bible says, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, don't you marry an unbeliever. You say, but Billy, I can marry him, and maybe I can get him converted and in the church after we're married. It never works that way. He always pulled you down. 
Because you see, when you married him to begin with, you broke the law of God. You broke the plain command and teaching of Scripture. I would 10,000 times rather die an old maid if there is such a thing. I call them unplugged jewels. Than to marry a man outside of Christ. And let me stop and put a parenthesis here. I believe that there's some women and some men that God calls to be single. He gives a special task, a special strength and a special ability. And to be single in Christ, to be a bachelor in Christ, if that is what God has called you to be, for special work and a special task, don't apologize. Thank God and rejoice that he's called you. I think the Apostle Paul might have been one of those type of persons. And there are many others mentioned in Scripture. But God has a divine plan, and one of his plans is that you're not to marry an unbeliever. And if you are going with a fellow and you're getting very serious with him and he's not a Christian, you better drop him like a hot cake. You're in danger. You're in trouble. You can't reform him because you're disobeying already. Be careful. You're playing with dynamite. And then... I want to say a word tonight to the wives, their responsibility, and a word to the husbands, their responsibility in the home, a word to the children, and then to the parents before we're finished. First, there's the wife. Now, uh, I hesitate to say some of these things, but I'm going to quote the scriptures and let the Bible speak. The Bible says that the wife is to reverence her husband. Ephesians 5.33, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, this doesn't mean that she's to idolize him or bow down five times before him every time he comes in the door. But it means that she's to treat him with respect. Ephesians 5, 23, the Bible says that the husband is to be the head of the house. And the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 22, 1 Peter 3, 1, Colossians 3, 18, and many other scriptures that the wife is to submit to the husband. The wife is to love her husband, says Titus 2, 4, and the wife is to be a keeper at home, says Titus 2.5. She's to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. How many wives today stay home? I heard on the radio the other day an analysis, an analysis that wives that work, that have families, by the time they pay taxes and by the time they get somebody to stay with their children at home, they're actually losing money rather than making money. Now there's a period when women can work before children come and after the children are away at school. And we have a tremendous labor force in America among women at that age. But unless it's absolutely necessary, I would caution that the wife stay at home and rear the children. My wife would like to travel with me everywhere. And I would like for her to travel with me everywhere. But we got on our knees and decided long ago that one of us had to be a keeper at home. And she said God has given her a congregation of five at home. And that's her ministry. And she takes a hickory stick in one hand and a Bible in the other and raises them. <laughs> She's really a wonderful mother. The only difficulty we have is when I come home, I'm the sixth child. Now, this doesn't mean that the husband is to lord it over the wife, not at all. Because the husband and the wife are equal in mind and conscience and position and privilege and freedom and happiness. But there's a balance of power in the home. Not a question of who is superior, because they're both superior in their God-given place. I heard uh, uh, to uh, a southerner some time ago who said, down in Alabama, he said, when we're working out in the field, my wife and I, and I tell her to do something, said, she better do it because that's my territory. But when we come to the house and she tells me to leave my muddy boots outside, I leave them outside because the house is her territory. You see, they've divided the responsibility and they get along fine. But the Bible says that if the wife does not take her place in the home properly, your prayers can be hindered 
And this interferes with your spiritual life. And this is a very serious thing for a Christian wife. Now, I know that some of you wives have to take over the responsibility of the home because of the type of man you marry. He doesn't take his responsibility as the head of the home, as a proper father and a proper husband. And you have to do some of these things. Bless you. Some suggestions to you wives. When your husband comes home from working all day, and you're in the kitchen, and he comes in the door, have on a fresh dress. Run and meet him and give him a kiss and welcome him home. Instead of yelling at him, is that you, John? <laughs> and be attractive, be attractive. No wonder some husbands don't want to come home. <laughs> and read and grow intellectually. Keep up with your husband. Study the things he studies so that you can carry on intelligent conversation about the things he's interested in. So many husbands go ahead of their wives intellectually, and after a while, in the morning when he comes down, he reads the paper. She has nothing to talk about. He has nothing to talk about. They have nothing in common. What a tragedy. And then curtail unnecessary expenditures. If you died, the only thing your husband would miss would be the bills at the end of the month that keep his nose to the grindstone. Now you fellows are grinning out there. I'll come to you in just a minute. <laughs> and don't gossip. All some children have for Sunday dinner is roast preacher. <laughs> like the little boy. His mother and father were entertaining the pastor for lunch on Sunday. And the little boy looked at the pastor with wide eyes while the mother was in the kitchen and said, Pastor, are you going to eat like a horse? <laughs> and he, he sort of gulped and said, why, no. Well, said, Mama says you do. <laughs> you better be careful what you say around the house. The little one's ears are listening, and they pass it on. Make the home attractive. Make it the center of activity. Don't nag and complain. And above all, be a Christian wife and a Christian mother. You can't be the kind of wife you ought to be without Christ. You know, I've never really understood how a woman could reject Jesus Christ. I've been all over the world, and in most parts of the world where Christ has never been, a woman is little more than an animal. It was Christ that lifted you to where you are in the Western world. He gave you the standing that you had, the place of honor and dignity. You ought to come out of sheer gratitude alone to Jesus Christ and pre let, present your life to him. And when you come to him, he gives you an inward beauty. You talk about going to the beauty parlor. He's the greatest beauty parlor in the world. That inward beauty that shines through. He can take the most unattractive woman, put Christ in her heart, and she becomes beautiful. There's a difference between being pretty and beautiful. He shines through and there's an inner beauty. Give your life to Christ tonight, you young women, and say, I'm going to let Christ help me choose my husband. You women that have already married, you're going to let Christ come into your heart and help you to be the wife and the mother you ought to be. It takes work, it takes sacrifice, but it also takes Christ. Now a word to you men, the responsibility of a husband. The scripture says in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How long has it been since you brought your wife some candy or flowers or gave her a kiss? I mean, a real kiss. And it wasn't a birthday. It wasn't an anniversary. You just did it because you loved her. Now, she may faint the first time that you do it. You haven't done it in so long. I heard about the man that rushed to the drugstore on his wife's birthday and he got some candy and flowers and he rang the doorbell singing, Happy Birthday, dear sweetheart. The wife came to the door and she burst into tears. Oh, Jim, this has been an awful day. The children have been so mischievous. The roast is burned. The phone is rung all day. And now you come home drunk. <laughs> Love your wives. Show your love to them. It's the little things 
that mean a lot in the home. The little thoughtful things that the husband does for the wife and the children in the home that mean so much. The Bible says husbands are to provide for their wives. The Bible teaches courtesy and thoughtfulness and kindness. But the Bible also says that you are to be the spiritual head of the home. And I want to ask you straight out, is grace set at the table in your home? Are prayers set in your home? Do you as the father open the Bible every day and have prayer with your family, your children, your wife? If not, why don't you start? What a difference it'll make in the atmosphere of the home. Or do you have your devotions by watching television? The only time the family's really together is at the television set. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have prayer together in the home? Now, it would take a great deal to swallow real hard, you men, and swallow your pride and go home and say to your wife tonight, Honey, you know I've been wrong. I've been neglectful at this point. I am the spiritual head of the home, and God does hold me responsible for the spiritual life of my home. Let, let's start reading the Bible and saying a prayer every day together. What a change there would be in your home, in your attitude, in your wife, in your children, in your own heart. Make it a Christian home. You want your children to grow up and go to church, don't you? You want them to grow up and be Christians? You want your children to read the Bible? You want them to pray? They're not going to pray and read the Bible unless they see you doing it. You tell them to do it. You say that they ought to do it, but they never see you doing it. So they see the lie in your life and the hypocrisy in your life, and it makes them even worse when they grow up. You have a spiritual responsibility, and if there's not a devotional life in your home, it's the husband's fault. According to the Scripture, God has appointed you the pastor of your home. You're the overseer of your home. Now a word to you parents. I believe that all of us parents are neglectful these days in not taking enough time with our children. This is one of my greatest difficulties in travel, is spending time with my children. My wife has to make up to it. But I heard about a father some time ago who gave his boy a Christmas present and it was a little note and it said, I'm going to spend one hour every day and two hours on Sunday with you from now on this next year, son. And the little boy threw his arms around his father and he said, Dad, that's the greatest Christmas present you ever gave me. Give your boy and girl a present. Give them time this year that they deserve and need. And set your family a good example. And you should also lead in the discipline of your home. Now, the Bible teaches discipline. You can't get away from it. Ephesians 6, 4, And ye fathers, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Proverbs 13, 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him sometimes. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he'll not die. Now, the Bible says if you discipline your child, he may cry and scream, and he'll sound like he's dying, but the Bible says he won't die. It does him good. And the Bible says if you don't discipline your children, you don't love your children. Now, that doesn't mean you take a stick. That doesn't mean you whip them and spank them, because each child is different. And it takes different types of discipline for different children. You have one child that you can speak to. That's enough. You have another, you have to speak to them a little different. Children are different. And if they don't have discipline, they're not happy. They are miserable. Children have to be controlled. They are made for authority. God made it that way. And he gave you the responsibility. Now, don't ever discipline a children in anger because it becomes a fight between you and the child. Always discipline the child in love. And if you're going to administer a little corporal punishment, which wouldn't hurt, and which would help a great deal, and we need more of it, explain to them for 10 or 15 minutes before you discipline them, love them a lot, then discipline, and then love them for a long time after. And you'll find that they'll love you many times more and when they grow up, they'll write you and say, Dad and Mother, 
thank you for the spankings you gave us. Thank you for the discipline you gave us. I only wish you'd done more. That's the way I feel about my father. My father, I guess, gave me a hundred whippings. Maybe a hundred times ten. But I needed many times more than that. And I came up during the Depression period, and my father didn't have much to give me, but he did give me some character. And sometimes he had to beat it into me, and I thank God for every bit of it. It made a man out of me. We need discipline administered in love. But of course, the greatest discipline is the example you set in the home. The Bible says, correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart, the scripture says. Now I want to say this as I close. You can't be the parents you ought to be without Christ. And you children, the Bible says you to obey your parents in the Lord. You can't be the type of child that you ought to be without Christ. We're living in a day of lawlessness and revolt. Rebels without a cause. We're revolting for the sake of revolting. Why? Because we have no authority. We don't have anything to believe in and commit ourselves to. Give your life to Christ. Because you see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for you. He died to forgive your sins, and his blood can wash your sins away. You've committed sin in this matter of marriage. The Bible says all of us are sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. The word sin means a breaker of the law. I've broken God's law, you've broken God's law. I need his forgiveness, you need his forgiveness. And as a parent, I'm certain that I have failed. In many ways, I need his forgiveness. And there have been many times that I've rededicated my life to Christ as a father and said, oh God, help me to be a better father for my children and a better husband for my wife. I'm not putting myself up as the great example. Christ is the example. But there are thousands of Christian parents and young people here tonight that need Christ in your home. You need his forgiveness. You need to be born again. You need to receive him as your Lord and Savior. You need to rededicate your life to him. You need to reconfirm your faith. You need the joy and the peace that he can bring. You need the power that he can give to help you live the Christian life. I'm going to ask you tonight to receive Christ into your life and into your home. I'm going to ask that you open your heart and say, yes, I want him to be the Lord and master of my heart and my home. As a wife, as a husband, as a father, as a mother, as a child in the home, I want Christ. I want him to be the head of my heart and the head of my home. I'm going to ask you to come and say, I will receive him, not only as Savior, but Lord. And I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand here in front, and after you've all come, we're going to have a prayer, a prayer of dedication. And we're going to have a scripture and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. I'm going to ask you to come. Men and women and young people, you need Christ. Right now, you need him in your heart. You may be a member of the church. You may be a deacon of the church or an elder of the church. You may be singing in this choir. You may be a young person and you've not committed your life really to anything yet. You're not certain what you believe. Come and give your life to Christ by faith. Now remember I said by faith. You can never come to Christ intellectually alone. You'll never understand it. If you wait until you can understand all about Christianity, you'll never come. You have to come by faith, and when you come by faith, Christ will change your life. He will give you supernatural power to live in a new dimension. He will help you to love. He's a living Christ. He rose from the dead. He's living tonight to help you to be the kind of man and woman and boy and girl you ought to be.